These are some early trilobites from China. And uh, this is a piece that came to me through uh, some Chinese that I was dealing with uh, from Beijing. And uh, this was back in the 80s when I got that slab. And uh, now they're actually illegal to even have them. And the, the government has put policies and restrictions on a lot of things that we do, especially with third world countries. So now these are considered national treasures in China and they're illegal here in the States. So I, it's okay for me to keep it, but I couldn't sell it to a museum because they, they have to have prominence when they buy something. This is a little collection here. Um, this is a little trilobite. Actually, let me back up a little bit here. It's really hard to see this little guy. But right here is the trilobite. And then this side is part of the trilobite that I haven't worked out. And when you find fossils, especially trilobites, they're in a marine sediment, limestone, mudstones, and uh, you have our dolomites, and you have to prepare them. So what you're looking at here, these little scratch marks are actually from pneumatic tools that were pecking around on the surface of this rock to pulverize it to get down to the trilobite that's underneath of it. And then these little tooling marks are the finished surface when you finish it. So it's a, it's a process, it's several steps long. And here's some of the tools that I use to prepare these fossils. These are pneumatic tools. They vibrate, uh, they have a real fast stroke, they operate off of 90 pounds of pressure. And uh, they sound like, kind of like a bee when you're working with them. But it pulverizes the rock. Then we use good optics, we use optivisor, sometimes a microscope, and of course a respirator. Well, here's an example of a trilobite that just molted. And what's happened is this trilobite was found right side up in the sea bottom. He's about eight inches long. And this part of the trilobite is missing because what's happened is he shed his skin. And to shed his skin, he keeps everything intact and he splits along these little sutures, they call them facial sutures, and he crawls out of his shell and that little part is ejected away. So sometimes you find these trilobites where part of them is missing and it's still a good specimen for study because it actually tells a story. This is a little trilobite from upstate New York called Isotelus and uh, is, it has a very shiny exoskeleton. And if you notice, as I go through this, what I'm trying to do is give you an idea of some of the different forms of trilobites that existed. There's over 20,000 species of them. Okay, so there's, there's some very conservative species and there's some that are very spiny and ornate. For the most part, this is a bottom dweller. It's called Isotelus, means equal portions. Each one of these names are scientific and they all describe some attribute of the fossil. This is another type of isotelus from Ohio and there he is upside down and there's his little mouth plate and this one is about 13 inches long. And this specimen here was excavated from Caesar Creek Lake and it's actually on the wall of the director's office of the National Museum of Natural History And it was part of a study that we did at Caesar Creek Lake in the mid 80s. <coughs> I've done a lot of work for the National Museum in Washington on our state fossil in Ohio, which is the Isotelus, which is this trilobite. And in the 1980s, uh, I got involved with Caesar Creek Lake in Waynesville, Ohio. And there's a huge exposure of Ordovician rock. Uh, this trilobite's about 438 million years old, and what you're looking at is just the underside of it. Um, here's another look at the underside of a trilobite, and it shows actually the legs and the gill structures. So it's kind of like a crayfish. They had what they called telepods and excites, and the excites were used for breathing, and the telepods were used for walking, so they're jointed legs and that throws it into the phylum of arthropods. Now trilobites are one of the only classes of arthropods that went extinct. So there's still many classes out there today. All of your insects, 
your little roly polies that you see in the garden, you touch them and they roll up. Well, that's what trilobites do. That was the defense mechanism. You could touch them and they roll up. Well, that was their downfall because as things evolved, as time went on, when trilobites first started in the Cambrian age 540 million years ago, there was no predators to speak of. And then things happened. Between the Cambrian and the Ordovician period, about 500 million years ago, the Earth was hit with a large asteroid. There was major changes in the surface of the Earth. Nothing like we've ever seen, because if it ever happens again, we won't be here. Now, this is a simple organism, actually, because it could freeze and thaw on the sea bottom, just like a lot of things, a lot of invertebrates can do that and they can survive and they can go from one period to another if there's an abrupt change in the environment. This is uh, little feeding traces of a trilobite walking across the sea bottom. These are the ripples and this is actually from Indiana and those are called trilobite tracks and they even have a name for that called diplognites. Some of these names are just mind-blowing if you get to thinking about who, who, who names them, and I call it job creation. These are some burrowing behaviors of trilobites. They burrowed down in the sediments and made actual troughs or wells in the sea bottom. And this is where a trilobite would burrow down in the sea bottom. And you have to imagine this is in reverse. So this is the bottom of the well, and this is the top. So he made that little trough in the sea bottom, and he rested right there. And you see this little split. Well, that's his legs on one side and the other. So what's happened is a storm came along, and the heavy particles of the storm filled in and made a cast in the sea bottom, and later it fell out, and I found it. And this here is a, a piece where there was probably 25 or 30 trilobites together, and they were all feeding, and, and there must have been some really good nutrients in that little trough that they were looking in and they all accumulated there and made what we call a nest. <clears throat> now trilobites started out real small, of course everything does, and uh, what you're looking at here is the actual uh, what they call protaspids of the trilobite. There was a stage before this called the facilis and it's microscopic, you can barely see it with the naked eye, it looks like a speck of dust. This is a protaspis, in other words, after the facilis molts out, it turns into something that actually has segments starting in it. And the protaspid is about a millimeter long. So to find these, you have to use a microscope when you're out collecting. And that's kind of clumsy because you've got, it's dirty, there's clay, there's mud, there's water, and it's a, it's a long drawn out process. So there's only a few facilis and protaspids known to man because it takes so much patience to actually find one. And the way they define them today is in a lab. They take the rock, they melt it down in acid, and they hope that the, the facilis or protaspis, the egg of the child bite, is actually made out of quartz so it doesn't dissolve away. And they sit there in these labs with microscopes and camel hair brushes and pick through debris one millimeter at a time till they find one. So some people are really dedicated to what they do. And this is a little tiny trilobite right there. That's a, I'm not sure where that laser is coming from, but this is a uh, little marasbid trilobite. And there's, you can get an idea of how big it is compared to a penny. And this one is about an inch long, the same trilobite. And what happens is, as they grow, they molt. And each time they molt, they add a segment until they've reached maturity. So even though this trilobite is an inch long, it's mature. It has all of its segments. And it'll go on to grow up to be 30 inches long if nothing eats it before it gets to that size. There's a, what we call an ontogeny. Uh, this gives you an example of how many times that trilobite could molt before it reached the size of one inch across. Now, this is what we call a fake ops. This is the one I was talking to you about with many eyes. Now, fake ops, the unique part about the eyes is that it was uh, used in the eventual conception of uh, what we call SDI, Star Wars. 
uh, the Reagan administration's dreamed up this idea of putting a defense system in space. And they designed the eyes after the fake ops eye because they could see in all directions in stereo vision, far away and up close. So they contacted me and said, do you know where we could get some eyes to work on? And I referred them to the National Museum and they in turn went ahead and started uh, what you might call back engineer the eyes. They did the optics on them and they figured out how that eye system actually operated 400 million years ago and they designed a system and I don't know if it ever made it out into space or not but my guess is it probably did. In the process of trying to figure out the eyes of these trilobites, they developed a system called liquid optics. And it's used in electron microscopes today or another type of, of um, surgery uh, for uh, doctors use them for some reason. But uh, it's one of the most, um, oh, I would say it's the most accurate optical systems that has, man has ever devised. And it's actually made of a, a liquid. So trilobites, are, they, they have applications for things that we're using today, even though they're hundreds of millions of years old. And I think that's the neat part about what we do. This is a sea scorpion. It's called a Eurypterid. But uh, 420 million years ago, they were one of the predators of trilobites. And they grew up to be nine feet long. And they come out of upstate New York. And the other predator would be a straight nautiloid or a squid, a cephalopod. And cephalopods grew up to 18 feet long. And today, cephalopods or squids grow up, they think, over 100 feet long. So we just looked at one that was down in the National Museum, and it's 80 feet long. So it's a big one. And it's modern day. give you an example, we, we also study, um, when, when you look at trilobites and you, and you go out collecting fossils of any kind, to find, your, to find what you're looking for, you have to be a detective. The fossils are in layers of the earth. There's about two miles of sedimentation in the earth that you can look for trilobites in. And each layer of sediment is a page of history. Something happened, it's a life event. So what you try to do is you learn who was eating the trilobite and what was the trilobite eating and what was living with the trilobite. So it's a detective story. And what we're looking at here is a trilobite. Whoops, I'll back up a little here, I missed it. Uh, what we're looking at is when I found this piece of this trilobite, this is a tail, and this actually has a little bite mark in it. So that tells me that some type of organism was feeding on it and it was a cephalopod or a squid. So when I look in a certain layer of rock, I'm looking for the squids because they're the ones that are eating the trilobites. This is one from uh, Sweden. And you can see there that this whole side of it has been chewed away. And he may have actually survived and went on to live because when trilobites, are, we found that when they're chewed around the edges, that they can actually survive and regenerate their shell. Here's another one. This is uh, called a Philonix. This is from Morocco, from the Anti-Atlas Mountains. And he actually has, a, this is the normal length of the spines on one side. And then this side, you can see they're much shorter. And this one here is actually split. So what this trilobite has told me is that he was rolled up in a ball when he was attacked on this side, right here, and he, all those spines were clipped off and he regenerated them. And in the process of regeneration, it actually split right here into what they call a bifid spine. Here's another tool that we use for trimming down rock. We don't just take and hit it with a hammer or use a pneumatic tool. Sometimes we use a trimmer on it. It's a hydraulic jack with two jaws and it pinches the rock down until it splits where you want it to split. <coughs> here's, here's an example of a, 
uh, specimen in, in uh, limestone, or actually it's in dolomite. And he's in the very center, and it's very hard. So I've got it inside of this trimmer, and I'm going to take this piece of rock off right here, with hopefully without breaking the trilobite. And there is a, it's trimmed off, and now I'm taking the pneumatic tool and going around it. And this is just a process that you use of, of finishing a trilobite up for an exhibit, if you will. So to get into the exhibit end of it, I was known for my preparation work uh, right up and from, I started preparing fossils um, in the late 50s. And um, as, soon as, I, as soon as I learned what trilobites were in fossils, I started learning how to prepare them. And in 1984, I was approached um, by the National Museum at an international show in Tucson, and uh, they wanted to buy parts of my collection for an upcoming gallery. Mind you, they, they worked many, many years in advance. So the gallery that they were buying for was, was supposed to open in 1990, and this was 1984. And I said, well, I have a lot of trilobites, but I don't want to sell them. I'd like to keep them. Why don't you come over to my house and, and have a look at them? So they came to Ohio, and we laid everything out in what we call the Corps of Engineers. That's where I was doing some studies at. And um, <clears throat> I, had, I laid out 500 pieces, 500 specimens that I had collected. And I said, well, which ones are you interested in? And the curator looked at everything and he says, we'd like to take all of them. And I said, okay. And I, I'm thinking, I'll sign a contract for a few years. I'll loan this material to you for an exhibit. In 2010, I got it all back. So 25 years, they had it on exhibit. And it went through two galleries. And about 200 million people got to see the material with my name on it, which is really cool because for me, um, it, it was an honor to have it done by the museum, but it was also advertising for me. So for, 20, for 25 years, I had people calling me from all over the world wanting trilobites. What, what better advertising can you get? So this was me in the early days. Um, my mom, <laughs> this is the funny part, I told you my parents never said no. Well, my mom used to take me to the quarry in Toledo when I was 12 and 13 years old and drop me off for a week or two weeks at a time with a pup tent and some food. And I would have the time of my life collecting fossils. And then she would come back in a couple weeks and pick me up. You can't do that today. They call that child abandonment. <laughs> but I loved it. And I would always come home with a pocket full of money. And this is the interesting part about my occupation. People came to these quarries where I collected from all over the world, Japanese, Italians, whatever, Europeans. They were from everywhere. And they were after trilobites. And I would have my tent, and I would have a pile of trilobites outside my tent, and they would buy them from me. And I would come home with a pocket full of money, and mom and dad would say, how'd you do that? You didn't go anywhere. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so this is actually a pavement or a road in the quarry. Uh, this surface that I'm collecting on is about 350 million years old, and it's actually the sea bottom that's been washed away by the storm. Uh, we had a lot of rains up there in Ohio. And a nice summer rain will clean off that road that the trucks drive on, which actually happens to be the seabed. And the trilobites are just laying there. All you have to do is pick them up. And then this is the other end of, uh, of what I do. Uh, this particular day, it was about 15 below zero. And we're, uh, we're what we call hardcore collectors. And when I was young, we'd get out. It didn't matter when it was. We would just find time to get out and collect. And rock really doesn't freeze. All you have to do is hit it with a sledgehammer, and you can still do the same thing in the winter as you do in the summer. And this is just a typical summer day, probably 100 degrees, in the same place, collecting on a dump pile, breaking rocks up with the sledgehammer. And we're, these are just chunks of the sea bottom. Sorry. Get my little laser out here. So yeah, there's a little chunks of the sea bottom. That's what we're breaking up. 
Now, this, this is that particular day when it was 15 below zero. And it was so cold, you could see ice crystals floating in the air. And that is just absolutely wonderful when you can get out in an environment like that and actually experience finding fossils that are so old. This is my friend. He's collecting. Uh, and there again, it's, it's very cold. And he's got, he's got his gloves on. And he's, and he's at it. He's hard at collecting. Now, today, you can't go near a quarry when they're blasting, OK? When I was a little kid, the quarry manager would say, go up there and sit on that ledge. And when the rocks quit flying, you can come down and collect. OK, that's how close we were. These rocks were actually flying over top of us in the quarry when we were sitting there collecting. <laughs> and here's another one where I'm actually sitting on a, uh, I'm sitting below a ledge. And uh, I'm waiting for the next rock to fall. Actually, I'm, I'm listening, because when you collect fossils in a quarry, you've got to be really careful about things that fall down on top of you. So what I was doing here was I was digging along this little ledge right here, and I was pulling rock out of this wall. But it's, uh, this is actually the sea bottom, if you will, layer by layer. And we just pull rocks out and split them up. <coughs> This is another quarry in Canada. Actually, no, no, this quarry was up in Sweden. And uh, in Sweden, still today, they allow you to drive down into the quarries and collect. Uh, there's no OSHA uh, regulations. And you can actually camp out in the quarries if you want overnight. And when I collected in this quarry, the interesting part about it was this is one of the only places on Earth where you can collect trilobites and other fossils with meteorites that have been shot through them while they were in the sea bottom, and they're still preserved. And they're 450 million years old. And uh, this quarry here, they, there's a drill right up there. And these tiers are about 80 feet high. And usually up around the edges where, is where they store all the blasting boxes. And my last trip over there, I needed boxes to pack my trilobites in to ship them back, so I put them in blasting boxes. And I didn't know that there would be a problem with customs. <laughs> they, they didn't like it. But I got them back OK. And this is an example of, of today. You can drive down in the quarries uh, uh, all through Europe and collect with no problem at all. And there's no restrictions. And that's me. I'm actually, uh, this is on summer solstice in Sweden. And it's um, light 24 hours a day. And the people that I were with were German. And they couldn't understand why I wanted to stay up all day and collect fossils. Because at night, they want to sleep. But it's light at night. Now I wanted to collect fossils. So I, I spent about a month up there. And I was wore out when I got home because I didn't get a whole lot of sleep. But I did get a lot of trilobites. <clears throat> and just to give you an example, if you were just walking along in a quarry up there, trilobites are so prevalent. There's one right there next to my boot print. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a fella that lives up there in, in uh, Norway. And up against the side of his barn are slabs of trilobites. And his philosophy is you can never have too many. So all around his house and his barn, he had trilobites. And we walked in his house, and all the floors in his house were like this. you know. And he says, oh, this is a fairly young house. It's only 400 years old. Because in Europe, especially Scandinavia, they don't have termites. So everything is old up there. Now, this is just an example. Uh, that was actually the cover of a magazine, uh, what they call Lapidary Journal. And it was a group of school kids and a teacher out at Caesar Creek, uh, where we did a lot of work for the National Museum. And my whole gist in all of this is to, to pass information forward and to teach, and especially the young ones, because that's where it's at. That's where I got started. So it's, it's nice when I can get a group of children out and teach them how to collect and open their eyes up it's just getting past the parents. That seems to be the hardest thing today, is letting the parents know that it's OK 
to let the children do something if they have, a, if they have an interest in it and see where it goes from there. And as you see, this is out at uh, Caesar Creek. We started a program out there in 1985 called Friends of Caesar Creek. And since that program was initiated, this is an Army Corps of Engineer project, we've issued over two million permits for kids to go collect fossils. And it's free. And this is my daughter, this is Jessica, when she was a couple years old, two, three years old, took her out there collecting. And today she's 23 years old and she's still collecting fossils and making jewelry and art and all that stuff. I don't know where she gets it from. And this is what we we're looking for out there. Just rolled up trilobites laying in the mud on the, on the spillway. <clears throat> now this was a dig that we did in 1985 or 1986 to 1989. It was on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project. And to date, I'm the only one that's ever been allowed to dig on that uh, Corps of Engineer project. And the reason for that being is because all of the fossils that I found were given up to science and reposited in the National Museum in Washington, D.C. And to do that, most universities and institutions won't give up what they find. They want to keep it in-house so that they can study it. So one of the, one of the stipulations was when I signed up to do this study, it lasted three years and 4,000 hours. I got a dollar an hour from the National Museum and the Park Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, took $18 an hour out for my time on the national or the general fund and they bought new cars and I got to buy or, or drive old vans around and eat peanut butter sandwiches. But the thing is, I, I got a lot of information for science and it all went into what we call the National Repository and their biological collections for study. So this is a typical day in a study out at Caesar Creek. And I have a microscope sitting there and a little bucket. And what I'm doing there is I'm mixing up plaster to actually extract a fossil or a trilobite from the clay that I'm digging in. I'm going the wrong way here. And what I would do is I'd take out about one square meter a day and over the course of three years, we took out about 350 square meters uh, with a, well, let's see, a paintbrush and um, a little hand scriber or what you call a little spatula. And we'd lift up the layers of rock about a sixteenth of an inch at a time and flip it over. And then we'd go ahead and grid out everything that was found within that little square within a day. And every once in a while, we'd run into something like that. That's about a 12-inch trilobite. And this one is actually upside down, which a lot of them, they, they were buried like that because they were buried in a storm. A lot of fossils that we find are suffocated through hurricane situations. And what we have to do is take all of the rock out of the inside of it. it takes about four hours. And leave the shell or the exoskeleton laying in the ground then we pour a plaster on it and we lift it out of the ground and then that's what it looks like. It's flipped over right side up and then it's prepared. And then a lot of times you'll, you'll get information. You put a little scale in there like a quarter and what we're looking at here is actually this trilobite here had shed its skin and its mouth is right here and its mouth should have been way up here. So a lot of times you can look at a piece and you can tell exactly where it used to be and you document it and say, okay, something happened here and so on and so forth. So this trilobite that came out of the ground that's in Caesar Creek at the visitor center, this is while I was preparing it. And that was actually the same night that I, uh, the night later after I found or the day after I found it. And it was prepared and then taken over to the center. And it's still on exhibit there. This one was found in 1989. And um, it's the only trilobite of the exhibit that was allowed to be kept by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Even though they're a branch of the government, the National Museum owned everything that the Corps of Engineers has beneath the surface of the ground. 
So that's what it ended up. Actually, this is another one that we found as a result of the Corps of Engineer project uh, in 1989. I had to figure out where the first examples of that particular fossil were found. So I had to go, um, go through some literature and it's, do a little bit of book work and I figured out, well, it was about 100 miles south of where I was actually collecting in Waynesville, Ohio, and it ended up being by Serpent Mound. So that's how I ended up at Serpent Mound. I went to Adams County, I went to the location where I was supposed to collect the fossils and it was for sale. And there was a for sale sign in the middle of a field. I was standing there for the first time, and a truck drove down the road, turned around, came back, and the guy says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, is this for sale? And he says, how much do you want to buy? So I ended up with 22 acres of land as a kid with no money, and the guy felt sorry for me and sold it to me on a land contract. So <laughs> in five years, I owned a piece of property. And um, I collected these trial, the largest trilobites in the world of that particular kind actually are found right on that property that I bought. And today I'm still finding them. They're still finding their way into institutions and museums all over the world. And it's nice because it inspires folks to actually go out and look for more because they see it and they're impressed by it. <clears throat> this is a slab I didn't, I didn't collect. This is actually from China. And I can tell you, I, I will never go into China. Uh, if I do, I'll be in prison. Because I used to prepare fossils for folks in China that uh, imported or exported dinosaur eggs and birds from the Jurassic period. And uh, there's a bird there, looks like um, Archaeopteryx, okay, that were found in Germany. But over there, they call them Confuciusaurus. And it's like a chicken. And because I was known for my preparation, these gentlemen from China looked me up and they said, could you prepare these birds for us? I said, sure. So I prepared these birds and I took them to an international show so that they could pick them up. And they said, no, just put them on your table and try and sell them. Well, I didn't sell any of them because they wanted too much money for them. And in the meantime, some little guys come in my room with little black suits on and took my card. And they looked like they were Chinese. Well, the end of the show came. I took the birds back to this gentleman's room. It was in Tucson. And he wouldn't answer the door. And I kept beating on the door, beating on the door. And finally, he came to the door. He says, go away, go away. He says, I can't talk to you. I said, I have to give your birds back. I can't sell them. You have to take them back to Beijing. He says, no, 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 you have to keep them. You I said, no, I don't want them. And I turned around and I walked away. It's the last time I saw that man, because he's in prison. The Chinese government came in and got them for exporting illegally a national treasure. And my name's on the list <laughs> because I prepared them. So I'll never go to China. That would be nice to go. But anyway, that specimen is, is one of the few specimens in my collection that I didn't actually find. These are little trial bites called agnostids. Uh, they were blind. They went around the bottom of the ocean, bumped into each other, ate food, and that was their day. This is what they call a patika parid. And what I'm going to do is go through some of the different uh, orders of trilobites, if you will, um, that are in the trilobite, uh, in, the, in the class of trilobites. And there's 10 different orders. And each order lasted anywhere from 100 to 300 million years. So they had a very long lineage. When you think about time, if you spread time out, if you spread it, I, I think how they compare it, if they were to spread time out in, in a straight line, the four billion years on Earth, uh, it would be about seven and a half miles long if you did all the layers of the Earth the way it's supposed to be, and we would be about seven inches of that timeline. So we've only been here a very short time. There's another example of all those little trilobites. <clears throat> This is a trilobite from Africa. It's kind of a rusty color because what's happened is the exoskeleton is oxidizing into what they call limonite. And this one's about 540 million years old. So it's one of the very first trilobites to have eyes. This is what they call Paradoxides. That's also from Morocco. That's about 16 inches in length. As you can see, it's got 
pretty good size eyes on them. Right there is his eyes. And you notice they're kind of semicircular. That's so you could see from front to rear in all directions. There's a mouth plate of a trilobite. This is actually from a trilobite that was a predator. Some trilobites were predators. They actually dug down in the dirt or in the bottom of the ocean looking for worms. This is an interesting one called Trichrepocephalus, and he's from Utah, and he's about 500 million years old. As you can see, there's lots of different styles of these trilobites. This is called Dicronurus monstrosus. That's from the Antiatlas Mountains. Very ornate. It almost looks like he has a mustache here. And these spines were actually used, they're finding out, for buoyancy in the water, kind of like a water spider. And they could float on the top of the water. And it was also used for protection. This is a called a little Odontopleurid, called Ketner aspis. It's from Utah. And that's Devonian age, by the way. That's about 350 million years old. Now, I don't know if we can see these, but there's little teeny tiny trilobites right here. They're actually living on these, what they call crinoid stems. And crinoid stems, by the way, are found all over the earth. They're actually an animal. Crinoid means sea lily in Latin. And the crinoid stem was used by Native Americans for beads. And they're also a protection symbol. So they're found, and they're still living today. They go back 500 million, 550 million, somewhere in there. And they still find them in the oceans today. So it's one of the most successful forms of life on Earth. This is called an Elanus. That's from Russia, from the Walkow River, uh, St. Petersburg. And notice his spines, he kind of curls around there at the end. Then he had big eyes. Perilagurus, that's from Morocco. That's Devonian, that's the Anti-Atlas Mountains. All the formations in the Anti-Atlas Mountains are not laying horizontal, but rather vertical because of the way the mountains were made from the pressures of the plate moving and actually bumped in and made the Anti-Atlas Mountains in the north of Africa. This is a Harpidae, uh, that's also from Africa. He has a real funny little head. He's got a little scoot around the front so he can get underneath of the mud and dig. And there's another Isotelus. That one's actually in the Budenshoff Museum, or what used to be called the Dayton Museum. And there's an Isotelus, or what they call a Saphus from Africa. So we know that Africa and North America were joined at one time along with Europe. And these are some different uh, types of asaphids from Russia showing that they could live underneath of the mud and use their long eye stalks poked out through the mud looking for predators so they wouldn't have to expose their bodies. This is an assemblage of fake ops, and this is actually from Toledo. This is one of the nicest pieces that's ever been found. When you find associations with this many trilobites together, it tells you that one of the theories is that they were getting ready to mate. And what they would do is they would get together before they mated in a hard-shelled state. They would molt their skins or their shells, and they would mate and then go off in their own directions. Most of the time, trilobites are found at one or two at a time. They're not very gargarious creatures. So these little guys are, are very rare. It's the needle in the haystack, if you will, or the holy grail. And a specimen such as that would sell for as much as $25,000. So when you find one, you go, whoopee, this is great. There's another little trilobite. You can see how big his eyes are. Some of them had very large eyes. <clears throat> and there's another mating assemblage. That's from Oklahoma. It's called, uh, those are Bumastids or Homotelus. <clears throat> and there's one from Canada. Those are Morosophids, that's from around Toronto. And there's one from Morocco, those are called Onia. And they've got funny little heads on them too. They've got little what they call cow catchers on the front of their heads. There's actually 84 pieces on that piece of rock, or 84 trilobites. 400 hours of preparation. I bought the piece for $100, and there was one trilobite sticking out of it. And I said, oh great, I'll prepare it, and I'll have a nice specimen. And I kept digging and digging and digging. And 400 hours later, I had all these trilobites exposed. 
but I had so much time in it, I couldn't possibly sell it because I wouldn't recover my cost. So I have it in my collection. It's a good way to collect things. This is a spiny fake ops. There's his spines coming up off his back. They're vertical spines. Some trilobites have over 100 spines on them. And these are some different types of what we call calamines. And, of course, the Proetus. He's actually stuck in a coral reef. He's from Indiana. But it seems like the, the Proetids were the most successful form. They were most conservative form of trilobites. And they lasted um, a little over 300 million years before they became extinct at the end of the Permian period. Now, a lot of these classes or groups of trilobites went extinct because of asteroid impacts on the Earth. I don't know how we got flowers in this. I think we reached the end of our reached the end of our slides. But anyway, I think that was near the end of that anyway. That one one last slide I was going to show you was from the National Museum. But um, <coughs> I just wanted to say that through collecting in all this, I didn't realize my spirituality in all this until 1976. And I realized that um, I had a communication with trilobites. And we were out on a dig in Ohio. And I, I was on a dig for several months with some other paleontologists. And we were taking notes of everything that were found. We were going in elevation, direction, position. And um, for whatever reason, just before lunch, on this graph, I wrote down something, this trilobite, Isotelus. Uh, eight and a half inches long, five and a quarter inches wide, facing north, 18 inches off the base. And I went to lunch, and I hadn't found this trilobite yet. And I came back from lunch, and I helped these two guys help me pull this big rock out. It weighed about 400 pounds, and we slipped it up on its side. And I put my chisel on it and split it. And there was a trilobite that I documented an hour before. And I said, okay, something's trying to tell me something. A few years later, in the Mojave Desert with my friend, and the same thing happened to him, but a little bit differently. He woke up from a dream in the morning. We're camped out on this hillside, and uh, he says, I just had this wild dream about this big trilobite I found. He described it to me. as a big cut across the head. It was gone, and it, it gave me the exact size. We walked up on the mountain in our holes and started digging, and it was a few minutes later. He pulled out, and he said, look, <laughs> there's the trilobite that I dreamed about. So these trilobites emit an aura, if you will. We all do. Everything on Earth does, even though it looks inert. Uh, as we're learning, even with the star knowledge, is that everything is vibrating. Everything is emitting an energy. And I just happen to be tuned into the energy of these little invertebrate fossils. So I've had this knack. I've developed it. And I don't know how it works, but I can walk up to a site that I've been collecting for years, and just Terry and I experienced this the other day. We walked in a little creek. I've been going down there for years, never really found much. And that day, I reached my hand, I walked right up, reached my hand under six inches of water, pulled out a little piece, and I said, I think there's a big trilobite under there. Reached down again and pulled it out and flipped it over. It's 15 inches long. It just happened. And it's, I don't know how I felt it, but I know I must have felt it because I went right to that very spot and picked it up. And this happens time and time and time again. And that's being connected with the earth. And these little critters are trying to tell us something. So the next step is, what are they trying to tell me? So I, I look at it when I, when I go out collecting, it's like time travel. I go back, I try to figure out what they were eating and, and who was having dinner with them. And it's just, you can get a picture of what it used to be like. And it was very pristine, unlike today, like Chief was saying. Uh, everything is, is polluted, and we, we have all this interference. But when we actually go out and go collect, you know, at least when I do, I disconnect from that grid, and I can communicate with what's in the earth. And that's the beauty of what I do. Yes, Terry? Oh, yeah, we do. 
This is what we do for fun. We find these little fossilized brachiopods, these shellfish, that are geodes. And we crack them, and when we start to crack open in them, because they're hollow, and we go, and we breathe the air in that's inside of them, and it's 400 million years old. Sometimes it's kind of stale tasting, you know? <laughs> but you gotta, you see how much younger I look? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, that's basically, I think we're done. But I, I, that just gives you an idea of, of a day in my life and, and what I've been doing. And it, it's been bizarre and it's been wonderful. And uh, it's just, if you can get kids interested in this, uh, to pursue a passion like that, don't, don't stand in their way. Don't ever stand in somebody's path. Let them do it. That's it. Thanks.